Smoke still hung over the ruins when we finally had a moment to breathe. We had freed Kralix, but at what cost? My feet sank into ash as I walked among the rubble of what was once a vibrant alien metropolis. The smells of burning and death were still fresh in the air. It had only been a few hours since the last bombs had been dropped and the Groks had finally retreated. But what remained was an apocalyptic landscape of collapsed buildings and streets covered in charred alien bodies. It's a win, Alex. A bitter victory, but a victory, Admiral Zorik said, his facial folds twitching in anguish. Zorik was one of the few alien commanders who had put faith in my more aggressive strategies. I just nodded silently. How could I explain to him that there were no victories in this war? Just different degrees of loss and sacrifice. The Krals had begged for our help, and we had rid them of the Groks. But at what tremendous price? I continued walking among the ruins, leaving Zorik behind. I needed to be alone with my thoughts for a moment. That's when I saw it a small shape huddled under a jumble of twisted beams. An alien child, no more than five years old by human standards. His face was smeared with soot and his body trembled, his big wide eyes staring into nothingness. As I approached, she flinched even more, letting out a terrified yelp. Hey, hold on, I said softly, raising my hands in a gesture of surrender. I'm not going to hurt you. It's all good now. She kept shaking, so I slowly lowered myself, meeting her startled gaze. What's your name? She hesitated for a long moment before answering in a trembling voice. Z. Zyrilli. Zyrilli. Beautiful name. Listen, I know you're scared, but the Groks are gone. We're here to help. His wide eyes scanned the surrounding wreckage. My family. They... I swallowed, knowing the answer before it even ended. I'm sorry, Zyrilli. Very much so. Tears began to roll down her gray cheeks. Why did they do that? Why did humans destroy our city? The blunt, innocent question hit my chest like a punch. I sat heavily in the ash, staring at my calloused hands. This is not an easy, small decision. I hate what we had to do to your home. But it was either that or let the Groks conquer the entire galaxy, enslaving or killing them all. I ran my hand through my unkempt hair. Sometimes, in order to stop a greater evil, we have to use methods. Well, quite violent. She sniffled, cringing her knees to her chin. But you are so powerful. Humans fight so well. Why didn't they just fight the Groks somewhere else? Such a simple question, but one that cut deep. Why really? Perhaps if we had mobilized earlier, sacrificed some worlds to save others of greater strategic importance. No, those thoughts led down too dark a path. We were doing what was necessary to save billions of lives. Sure, it's complicated, Zyrilli. Believe me, no one mourns the loss of your city more than I do. I held out my hand as comforting as it might be. But I promise it wasn't in vain. Their sacrifice helped liberate this planet from the Groks. And one day, when this horrible war is finally over, we will build a much better future for you and all children. She studied my face for a moment, then hesitantly placed her small hand in mine. Her eyes still brimmed with fear and loss, but also a spark of youthful hope. You humans are very strange, she said finally, at once kind and terrible. I nodded slowly, squeezing his little hand. Yes, we're a really complicated race. At that moment as we sat among the rubble, I knew that this war had stained my hands with blood that would never be washed away. But if he could have kept other innocent children from going through the same thing as Zyrilli, then all the sacrifice would have been worth it. It was a comforting thought. At least, that's what I needed to believe to keep my humanity intact. The corridors of the space station whizzed with frenzied activity. Alien engineers and technicians ran back and forth transporting equipment and supplies to the assembly hangars. I pushed my way through them, my determined footsteps echoing across the metal floor. At the center of it all, I found my team clustered around a series of workbenches. Holographic displays rotated slowly, projecting technical designs of armaments and images of recent battles. I felt a moment of pride looking at that unlikely mix of humans and aliens working together without a break. 
status report, I ordered, causing everyone to turn to me. Soren, my Christian intelligence officer, was the first to speak. The data collected in the last three battles has been cross-referenced with the captured Grok's engineering specifications. We have a much clearer picture now of how their weapons and shields work. Great. What about prototypes? This time it was Karen, my human chief engineer, who answered. We have already integrated the proposed adaptations to our plasma pulse weapon designs. The first test models should be ready today. I nodded with satisfaction. Our long hours of work were finally paying off. When the aliens summoned me to take over the war effort, I knew that our only hope was to harness human innovation and adaptability. Great job, guys. Stay focused. These weapons can be our decisive advantage. As I walked between the benches analyzing the projects, the grave expression on the face of Vril, my assistant Shanksy, caught my eye. Any problems, Vril? I asked quietly. He hesitated before answering in a tense whisper. I can't help but think about how we're cobbling together technologies of mass destruction, Alex. Where we come from, the Shanxi consider science a noble discipline to improve life, not annihilate it. I sighed, running my hand over the back of my neck. Believe me, it wasn't an easy decision for me either. I hate to have to pervert scientific knowledge like that. I fixed my gaze on his, but the Groks left us no choice. Either we find a way to overcome their military might, or they will devastate us. Vril shook his head slowly. Still, resourceful as humans are, perhaps this solution is too risky. Such a powerful weapon can consume us as well. Maybe, it's a risk we need to take. I went back to the technical diagrams. I have witnessed the horrors of war before in my own world. I know it's a dark road full of moral pitfalls. But for the survival of our species, we must have the courage to face this darkness. A tense silence hung over both of us for an instant. Then Vril put a hand on my shoulder in a gesture of friendship. You're right, old friend. If we really have to walk this dark path, there is no one better to guide us than you. At that moment, a Porvin technician approached with one of the new weapons, a cylindrical prototype that resembled a land-based grenade launcher. He handed it to me respectfully, a glint of anticipation in his composed eyes. I raised the experimental weapon, feeling its weight balanced in my hands. A born instrument of destruction, and yet a masterpiece of engineering. A fitting symbol of the tragic mission we had embraced. Gathering the rest of the team, I explained the final technical details of what we dubbed the Pulse Cannon. By the time I was done, a gloomy mood hung over all of us. They understood what we were about to unleash on the Groks, and about ourselves. Guys, I began with a solemn voice. I'm not going to lie, the road ahead of us is bleak and full of sacrifices. But if we retreat now, the cost will be the total destruction of our worlds, our cultures, our future. I looked into the eyes of every member of the team, human and alien alike. What we have forged here is a terrible weapon, yes, but it may also be our only hope for victory, to rebuild a galaxy where war and death no longer reign supreme. I paused, embracing that moment of collective resolution. You are with me on this dark journey, but necessary, one by one, everyone nodded determinedly. The conference room at Pyrov Station was packed almost to the point of suffocation. Representatives of dozens of alien species squeezed into the curved seats, staring at me with a mixture of hope and suspicion. In front of me, the holograms rotated slowly, projecting grim statistics from the campaign against the Groks. I took a deep breath, my eyes trailing over their tense faces. Officer after alien officer had witnessed the human tactics and weaponry ravaging the Grok's armies. Some considered us barbarians, while others saw us as the only chance of survival. Now it was my task to convince them to join us once and for all. Ladies and gentlemen of the Council, I began, my voice echoing authoritatively through the room. We saw here a rare opportunity to form a unified military alliance against the Grok's threat. Together, by pooling our resources and expertise, we can turn the tides of this war. I paused, letting my words hover. 
Several delegates exchanged uneasy glances, but no one dared interrupt me yet. Well, it was my moment. You have all witnessed the impact that human technologies and tactics have had on recent battlefields. Our hybrid pulse weapons were able to hit the Grok's energy cores, neutralizing their technological advantage. Our encirclement maneuvers and concentrated attack on weak points proved to be an effective formula. I pointed to the stats spinning next to me. The numbers don't lie. Over the past three months, combined human-alien forces under my command have repelled eight large-scale Grox offensives. We have reclaimed more than 20 vital star systems. A tense murmur ran through the audience. Most already knew about the hits, but hearing them listed like this was still a shock. Some seemed inspired, while others looked at it all with clear discomfort. Admiral Vissel, a veteran of countless battles, raised one of his forearms in a request to speak. I nodded for him to continue. Commander Alex, no one here questions the effectiveness of your strategies against the Groks. But we also can't ignore the trail of mass destruction they leave behind. Vissel activated a different hologram, displaying devastating images of ruined alien cities after our battles. Once vibrant worlds have been reduced to rubble, Millions of non-combatant civilians have had their lives cut short. Is that really the only way? A nervous buzz ran through the room. Many delegates watched with grim expressions as images of the horrors of war paraded by. I had to look away myself, swallowing the bile that rose in my throat. Admiral Vissel is right in your regret, I replied after a heavy pause. War is a terrible beast that consumes everything in its path. Believe me, none of us humans embrace it willingly. I walked up to Officer Ibixai, meeting his piercing gaze. But we need to be clear the alternative is to allow the conquest and enslavement of the entire galaxy by the Groks. I can't promise a campaign without casualties, but I can promise you that every difficult decision, every world sacrificed, will be to ward off this nightmare. I returned to the center of the room, my eyes scanning every alien face there. We are left with no choice but to fight with all the weapons we have, even if some seem barbaric at first glance. Because in fact, the only real barbarity would be to surrender to the Grok's genocide. A tense silence hung over for long moments. Then, one by one, the alien leaders began to nod reluctantly. Vissel lowered his arms, a glint of resolute acceptance in his gaze. Very well, Commander. I can't say that I approve of all your methods, but you've proven that you have what it takes to guide us to victory. He turned to the other delegates. It's time for us to put aside old rivalries and come together completely under unified leadership for the survival of our galaxy. Quickly, the other leaders expressed their agreement in a cacophony of alien languages and gestures. A buzz of apprehension hung over, but also a spark of hope ignited. As I watched the Alliance finally form, I couldn't help but feel a mixture of relief and trepidation. I had the unified command we so desperately needed, but what bloody price would we still have to pay for that decision? The monitors flashed with a steady rain of battle data energy readings, damage reports, attack trajectories. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the red lines of enemy forces move relentlessly across the holomap. Grok's motherships locked particle cannons. The Delurian operator's voice sounded strained. Direct impacts on the Gamron and Ladian squadrons in 5-4. Allied forces, execute an evasive Delta Niner maneuver, I ordered, my mouth instantly dry. Direct the triple pulse guns at the left flank Grok's. Blow up that hallway now. My alien officers worked frantically, strumming the controls to implement my tactics. Through the bridge's large display, I could see the immense alien ships meander in elaborate evasive formations, repeatedly firing their unique weapons at enemies. A high-pitched hiss echoed through the speakers as a Ladian cruiser disappeared in an explosion of metal and plasma. I clenched my fists but refused to lose focus. Progress of the flank attack, I demanded. Triple cannons loaded and aiming at the engines of the Grok's mothership. A Scorvy technician replied sharply, Permission to fire? I analyzed the tactical readings once more, looking for any weaknesses in the revolving wall of alien death. 
Lives depended on my next decision. Shoot, I determined simply. Pulse cannons spat out their energized projectiles at a frenzied rate. For an instant, the bridge shook with the force of the gunfire before our deflectors stabilized the situation. In the viewfinder, one of the gigantic Grox engines spewed sparks and flames as the projectiles pierced it. But then, the enemy particle guns pivoted and opened fire, forcing our ships to disperse. Full perforation laser loading, shouted one of the engineers. Sixty seconds to shot. I shook my head tenaciously. A long time. The Grox would go into a defensive frenzy. Have we exhausted all other options? The alien officers looked at each other, then shook their heads in despondency. There are other ways, said Prala, my Karnathi counselor, softly. His facial tentacles rippled in concern. Options that your people would call a last resort. I stared at her for a moment, noticing the implied insinuation. Then I let out a long sigh, closing my eyes. Seeing everything we've built being swept out of space again was not an acceptable possibility. Authorized last resort procedures, I replied in a somber voice. Prepare the Grox model Roman 277B quantum breakthrough warhead. A shocked silence fell over the bridge. Only the sounds of battle alerts echoed. Some of my team stared at me with obvious disbelief. Sir? A strategist Vimdoer began, his voice trembling. An antimatter weapon on such a massive scale. It would destroy not only the Grox, but the entire star system. I looked around the bridge, meeting the fearful eyes of the aliens there. Suddenly, I felt very tired and old. How many other moral lines would I have left to cross before the end? I know what this warhead is capable of, Lieutenant, and I don't take that decision lightly. I paused, trying to find the right words. But the Kehildjur system is not inhabited. It's just a Grox outpost. If we lose the battle here today, it will be the beginning of the end for all of us. I nodded to the fire control center. Prepare the warhead for launch. The alien technicians looked at each other once more, then began connecting cables and powering activation sequences. An immense, gleaming warhead of antimatter began to form in the main launch tubes. The very existence of that weapon was a blasphemy against the fundamental laws of the universe. But the Grox had forced us into these dark depths of mutual annihilation. At least this time, maybe it would be the last. Commander. A hoarse voice sounded beside me. I turned to find Vril, my old friend and assistant Shanksy. His elongated face was gloomy, but there was a sad determination in his eyes. I know there must be a good reason for that, he continued in a measured tone. I just... I hope that this darkness that we behold will not blind us completely. I put a hand on his shoulder, surprised by his unwavering faith even now. Thank you, my friend. Your reminder of our humanity is all I have to hold on to sometimes. Then I turned to the apocalypse weapon floating in front of us. May the alien gods forgive us all. Quantum rupture warhead charged and armed, echoed an impartial electronic voice. I'm waiting for the final coordinates, the last ones by the lines being crossed. With a pained sigh, I dictated the coordinates of the battlefield. May the heavens allow this to finally end. The conference room at Pyrev Station was plunged into tense silence as I entered. The hesitant, accusing looks of the alien delegates weighed heavily on me at every turn. I could feel the thick suspicion in the air, almost like a toxic haze. I took my place at the head of the oval table, staring at all those frowning, skeptical expressions. For a moment, I imagined just turning my back and letting them sort out this mess themselves. But there was too much at stake to give up now. Ladies and gentlemen, I began in a controlled voice. It's obvious that many of you have. Concerns about recent events. So I'll cut to the chase, yes, I authorize the use of an antimatter warhead in the Kehildjur system and I would repeat that decision a hundred times if necessary. An indignant murmur ran through the room. Admiral Vissel, the four-armed Ibixai, was the first to rise in protest. Not only did this weapon destroy the Grok's stronghold, but it completely vaporized the entire star system. 
Billions of cubic kilometers of space is now a deadly anomaly of radiation and distorted gravity. I nodded calmly. A terrible consequence, but a necessary one to turn the tides of that critical battle. Necessary? The shrill voice came from Minister Garob, Ambassador Trunky. His flattened face was contorted in fury. You've just declared war on physics. The consequences of such a violation of the fundamental laws are unforeseeable. I took a deep breath, reminding myself that exploding wouldn't help at all. Compassion and patience needed to come first and foremost. Believe me, Minister, I am the first to deplore the use of such aggressive weaponry. I looked into the eyes of each of them. But I'm also realistic enough to understand that the existence of our entire galaxy is at stake right now. If the Groks manage to regroup and resume the offensive, none of us will be safe. Grand Admiral Huklov, the wrinkled-skinned Pecorian matriarch, let out a sarcastic sneer. As if the so-called Grok's evil were worse than contemplating our own extinction by the disruption of the space-time continuum. There were a few murmurs of agreement, but only a few. Most of the alien leaders remained in tense silence, conflicting emotions evident on their faces. I massaged my temples, feeling a migraine begin to form. How could I make them understand? I'll explain one last time in all honesty, I began slowly. Yes, the quantum breakthrough warhead poses a calculated risk to the very fabric of reality. But what did they suggest? Let the Grok's forces reorganize and inevitably resume the offensive. I pointed to the holographic projections swirling in the center of the table. The numbers speak for themselves, gentlemen. Had that redoubt remained intact, our advance would have been stopped immediately. Years, maybe decades of progress would be lost in a long war of attrition that we couldn't win. I paused, letting my words hover. So yes, I employed tactics. To neutralize an existential threat. Not with pleasure, but out of necessity. Because I will not rest until the Grok's threat is completely eradicated from this galaxy. Even if to do so I have to wipe every last one of them off the face of existence. A heavy silence fell over the room. The delegates exchanged fearful and evaluative glances, unsure of how to respond. Some clearly still harbored deep distrust of me. But in many, I could see a new and reluctant understanding beginning to sprout. Finally, Minister Garob stood up, his little body stiff. I can't approve of this. Outrage to the laws of nature, Commander Alex. But I must acknowledge that his military credentials are formidable. He hesitated, then made a reluctant gesture with one of his paws. As much as it embitters me, you can proceed with your aggressive battle plan. But we warn you if the worst happens, the additional weight on your back will be incalculable. It was far from absolute acceptance, but everyone there knew it was the best I could get at that moment. I nodded in grim acknowledgement. Your concerns have been noted, Minister, and I willingly accept responsibility for my decisions, regardless of the consequences. One by one, the other alien leaders agreed with tense nods. It seemed that we had come to a precarious agreement, and with this reluctant alliance sealed for another bloody day, we could continue our campaign against the Groks, no matter how bleak the path became. Warning lights flashed frantically across the bridge as explosions shook the entire structure. I clung to the back of my seat as another salvo of enemy guns thundered against our shields. Critical damage on lower decks, a Nyron officer shouted over the chaos. The antimatter containment core has been hit leak imminent. I felt the blood run cold in my veins. A leak from the antimatter reactor would not only consume the entire ship, but leave a residual space-time anomaly capable of easily engulfing the entire battlefield. Prepare separation warheads, I shouted to the mixed crew. Detonate the outer rings of the ship now. Abandon the bow sections. A hail of order and counter-orders filled the air as my alien officers sprang into action. For a brief moment, the enemy forces were forgotten as we fought desperately to save what was left of the immense ship. A succession of controlled explosions began to erupt along the hull, separating the internal sections of the reactor. The bridge shook violently as the last connecting links were broken. All the front decks have been unglued and sealed, 
Prowla announced, her elongated face glistening with sweat. Main engine room capsule loosened, away from gravitational fields. In the main viewfinder, I could witness the distorted shrapnel from the slowly rotating antimatter reactor, dragged away by the action of the emergency explosive charges. It was a spectacle that was both beautiful and devastating. A collective sigh of relief ran over the bridge for an instant. Then the Grox guns opened fire again, impacts splashing against our floating shields. Multiple damage in sectors 12 to 23, a Vimni technician shouted. We've lost bow shield and heavy weaponry. The lights flickered as yet another explosion ripped through the ship's central column. I clung to the tactical control desk, my knuckles already turning white. We couldn't continue on that defensive line for much longer. Alx, a dabro arc vroln, a deep voice grunted behind me. I turned to meet Goros, my Tokriv advisor and longtime friend. His hooded body was scarred with many scars, but his eyes shone with the ruthless resolve that only the most hardened warriors possess. Our shields are failing, Alex, he translated in a calm tone. But we still have a chance to fight back against these damn groks, with all our might. Gorbin barely needed to say what he was suggesting. For months I had resisted employing our secret weapon, fearing the consequences of its large-scale devastation. But now his back was against the wall. I met Tokriv's gaze for a long moment of mutual understanding. Then I nodded with a controlled exhalation. Very well. Prepare the Grox antimatter pulse cannons for maximum disintegration mode firing. A shiver ran through the alien officers on the bridge as they recognized the gravity of that order. Our latest hybrid weapons, powered by captive antimatter cores, were capable of virtually unlimited destructive force. Even a single salvo could reduce entire worlds to scattered atoms. Technicians worked frantically, connecting power conductors and synchronizing the firing sequences. Outside, the Grox cannons continued to harass our ship, opening larger and larger craters in our weakened shields. On the main display, the monitors displayed the enemy fleet in all its evil glory. Endless lines of cruisers, gunboats, motherships, a black sword embedded in the heart of our advance across the galaxy. Firing of the antimatter cannons in ten, nine. I could barely hear the countdowns. Instead, I focused my eyes on that revolving wall of alien death, determined to break it through completely. Three, two, A. Fire. My voice sounded low but firm. The guns tinkled electronically as the huge firing levers were pulled. For a brief moment, nothing happened. Then the whole bridge shook violently as the disintegrating shells were expelled. In space, massive explosions erupted between enemy ranks as antimatter beams found their targets. The vision was momentarily extinguished in a blazing, blazing fire, like a small sun being lit in a vacuum. As the brightness dimmed, I contemplated the damage done with a numb sensation. Where once there were solid masses of Grox cruisers, now only sparse clouds of atomic vapor and superheated debris remained. Our ultimate weapon had reduced an entire enemy fleet to scattered elemental particles. The destructive force was almost incomprehensible. Even with everything we had already faced, a part of me just didn't want to believe what we had created. But as my senses returned, Slowly a single thought permeated my numb mind done. The Grox were finally defeated in this region. For today, at least, there were no celebrations or victories on the bridge. Only a grim silence as we allowed ourselves to absorb the new level of devastation we had unleashed. The war was far from over, and when it was finally over, it remained to be seen if we would still be recognizable as humans. The planet Coverall became visible through the main viewfinder when our invasion fleet emerged from hyperspace. Its vast blue and white disk swirled majestically, filled with verdant continents and huge masses of crystal clear water. It was a world of almost supernatural beauty. And our next target. Status report, I ordered, pacing the command deck with hands folded behind my back. All arms of the task force have reported exiting hyperspace without incident, sir, a Pecorian officer replied sharply. The weapons, sensors, and propulsion systems are fully operational. 
I nodded with satisfaction, staring at the view of the spinning planet out of the corners of my eyes. Hard to believe that in a few hours we would be reducing that celestial wonder to a battlefield. Vril, my assistant Shanksy, approached me cautiously. His facial tentacles twitched nervously. Alex, once again I'm forced to question this course of action, he said in a low tone. The Groks have already been kicked out of most outdoor systems. Why do we continue this devastation? I turned to face him, meeting his pleading expression. I sighed, feeling the weight of it all drag me down even more. Because we can't just stop, old friend. Until the last Grok stronghold is eradicated, this threat will never truly be over. I swallowed, my words having a bitter taste. The battle for Koveril could be the final blow we need. Your world is one of the few remaining major starports under Grok's control. If we take it, we will have effective control of this entire region of the galaxy. Vril looked at the beautiful planet with sad eyes. So once again the survival of our galaxy requires the sacrifice of an entire world. Is it really an acceptable price? Before I could answer, an alarm sounded across the bridge. A Narlatch officer urgently waved to us. Commander, we are being contacted directly by a Grox emissary in Coverall. They want to open immediate surrender negotiations. I frowned, surprised. This was the first time the Grox had shown any willingness to discuss peace terms. I motioned to the crew to immediately put the hologram on full screen. The enormous figure of a Grox loomed before us, its crab-like body gleaming with countless articulated limbs. His deep, distorted voice echoed across the bridge. Commander of the Allied Forces, this is a direct transmission from High Stratego's Kryloth of the Grox armies. We recognize that the momentum of their campaign can no longer be stopped in a protracted war. He paused, his alien body twisting in reluctant defeat. For that reason, we offer our unconditional surrender and evacuation of the remaining forces of Koveril. In return, we demand only that our civilian populations be spared and repatriated to our home world. I tensed as I listened to the words, hardly believing it. Was the war finally coming to an end? After so much sacrifice? Vril, looking equally shocked, approached and spoke in a low voice. We should consider this offer, Alex. We can spare the slaughter of this world. I swallowed, weighing the options. It was a chance to end this without another bloody and terrible battle. To avoid further unnecessary bloodshed. But then a sinister thought began to plague me. What if it was all a trap? Couldn't the Grox just be feigning surrender to lure our forces? It wouldn't be the first time they'd used such dastardly tactics. Cold determination welled up within me as I stared at the alien in the hologram. They had proven time and time again that they could not be trusted. Not this time. With a pained sigh, I raised a hand to cut off the transmissions. Kryloth, your offer of surrender, is rejected. We will proceed with the total conquest of your base at Coverell by any means necessary. The members of the Grox writhed violently in an explosion of alien fury. You sign the condemnation of your own kind insolent. They will all be destroyed, as well as their precious allied forces. I turned off the transmission before he could finish his menacing grunt. For a moment, a massive silence hung over the bridge, so I turned to the commanding officers. Communicate to all wings of the fleet general order of battle. Prepare all armaments for orbital bombardment and all-out attack with our largest warheads. My chest tightened as I gave the order. This meant the destruction of Culveral, regardless of the presence of civilians. But I couldn't risk falling into yet another of the Grox's cunning traps. Vril watched me with a blank expression, shocked by my actions. I walked over and rested a hand on his shoulder in a gesture of hollow comfort. I wish there was another way. But I can't leave anything to chance at this critical stage. Not when we're so close to the end. He didn't say anything, just nodded with a sad look. And outside, battle preparations began. The air tasted of ashes and destruction. Acrid smoke hung over the fields of Ziranok where our entourage tread cautiously. Mounds of twisted metal and gaping craters in the earth were all that remained of the Grox camps we had bombed. 
A gloomy feeling came over me as I contemplated the ruined scenery. It was hard to believe we were celebrating a win here. These ruins were only the latest symbol of the terrible cost of our campaign against the Groks. Admiral Huklov, the Pokorian leader of our alliance, walked beside me, his wrinkled skin twitching into a frown. I must admit your Ziranok conversion strategy worked better than we could have expected, Commander, she grumbled. The Groks certainly didn't expect that we would turn their own garrison world against them. I nodded absently, my eyes scanning the extent of the devastation. For months this had been an important enemy stronghold, garrisoned with its best defenses and thousands of troops. Then we applied our largest hybrid disintegration weapons in a simultaneous orbital strike. The effect was overwhelming square miles of Grok's campsites, simply vaporized in a fraction of a second. Now all that remained was debris and lethal radiation covering the once fertile plains. Indeed, Admiral, I replied quietly. But I wonder if this victory was really worth the price. Huklov stopped abruptly, his compound eyes sparking in my direction. Don't come to me with that hesitant attitude now, Alex. Not after everything we've been through to get here. She pointed a wrinkled claw at the ruins around us. The Groks brought it upon themselves. This hideous alien plague has nearly destroyed everything we hold dear. At least this world is now free from their evil influence. I frowned, feeling the old frustration building inside me. How could the aliens continue to find my actions so hard to understand? Yes, I'm aware that the Groks are the real enemies here. But look what this victory forced us to do. I waved in a great arch to the ruined fields. To reduce an entire planet to this. Radioactive desolation. There was a time when such tactics would have filled us with horror. Huklov opened his jawed mouth to protest, but I interrupted it with a raised hand. No, let me finish. I understand the military justifications for what we did. But I can't just accept that and pretend we're still the same as before. I sighed deeply, feeling a weight on my shoulders. You aliens seem to forget most of the species present here had never experienced all-out war before this crisis. But we humans know it all too well. We know the dark paths it drags us down towards, the moral and ethical lines we are tempted to cross. I paused at the edge of a still smoldering crater, staring blankly at the cracked hole, as if it were a mirror to my own soul. So yes, we won this decisive battle, but at an unimaginable price in destruction and brutality. Even if we win the war, we will be scarred by these scars forever. Silence fell when the other members of the entourage caught up with us. Huklov studied me at length for a moment, his gaze unfathomable. You're right, of course, she finally admitted in a heavy tone. We may not even begin to comprehend how deep your war scars are, Alex. His expression softened slightly as he met my gaze. But while I see the horrors caused here, I also see reason for hope. For even if your species has indulged in such extreme tactics, yet you fought to save us. She pointed to some alien figures walking in the distance captured Grok's civilians who would be released and repatriated to safety, as promised. Maybe your humanity hasn't been fully consumed after all. This is what I must hold on to as I contemplate the hazy future that awaits us. I looked at the alien silhouettes walking in freedom and realized what she meant. Perhaps, just maybe, there remained a spark of decency and compassion within us, even in this dark new post-war world that we had helped to shape. We could have done terrible things in the name of victory, but at least we still had a chance however tenuous to redeem ourselves for what we did. It was all I could cling to as I contemplated the acts for which we would be judged. The conference rooms of the Tarkin Reconstruction Station were filled with a tense hubbub of diplomats and officers of all allied kinds. I walked among them, waving a forced smile at solemn, suspicious faces. The war was finally over, but the price had been almost incalculable. Entire star systems lay in ruins. Displaced civilian populations wandered homeless and an indelible collective trauma had been left in every surviving world. I sighed heavily as I stood on the main podium. How could I usher in this new era of peace and reconciliation with so much blood still staining my hands? 
How could they ever trust me again? Taking a deep breath, I triggered the address system. My voice sounded amplified by the speakers of the circular chamber. Honored members of the Alliance, leaders of our great species, it is with a mixture of joy and regret that I address you today. I paused, my eyes scanning the vast alien audience. Most of them stared at me with inscrutable expressions. We have finally achieved what seemed to be an impossible goal, the total defeat and unconditional surrender of the invading Grox forces. Their threat of mass destruction has been neutralized, and our galaxy once again breathes a sigh of relief. A few hesitant nods and low murmurs punctuated my words. I tried to project an air of optimism, despite the restlessness that was growing within me. However, it would be dishonest not to acknowledge the terrible price we have had to pay in this conflict. My next few words could barely come out. Entire worlds have been wiped out. Star systems have been erased from our maps. And trillions, trillions of civilian and military lives have been lost on the battlefields. An eerie silence hung heavily over the assembly. I shuddered, imagining that I could feel the weight of each lost soul like an anchor on my back. So, yes, let's celebrate our victory against the great evil of the Grox. But let us not let this joy blind us to what it has cost us to get here. By shedding so much unprecedented blood and destruction, we stain our own souls in pursuit of survival. It's a burden that all of our surviving species will have to carry forever. A wave of nervous whispers ran through the audience. Some alien leaders stared at me with grim expressions, while others looked away, visibly uncomfortable. I focused on controlling my panting. And at the heart of it all is the ghost of what we humans have become in the fire of this conflict. Now the murmurs were louder, more tense. To ensure the survival of our species, we have embraced strategies and tactics that have challenged our most fundamental moral and ethical codes. In the end, we were the ones who launched the ultimate weapons of mass destruction. We are the ones who orchestrated the most devastating attacks. Our own species has become the destroyer of worlds. The chamber sank into a sepulchral silence as my painful confession hung in the air. The alien leaders looked at each other hesitantly, many with blank stares of shock and barely concealed anguish. Part of me wanted to stop there, to spare everyone from further suffering. Instead, I took a deep breath and proceeded in a firm voice. I know that for many of you, this retrospective of the horrors we have created is difficult, perhaps even unbearable to hear. But I need you to accept the awful truth whatever humanity is left in us, after all we have done, is stained in a way that we may never be able to wash away again. I pointed directly at the silent crowd of aliens. And now, that same legacy will haunt us forward, a constant reminder that when pushed to the limits of survival, even the highest ideals can be discarded in the name of self-preservation. So it's up to all of you to decide what to do with us from here on out. A long moment dragged on as the alien leaders digested what I had just admitted. Some species stared at me with barely concealed contempt. Other times I could see sparks of reluctant understanding. Finally, old Gralter Dazili stood up. His slight body trembled slightly as he addressed me. His acts were truly terrible, humane. And you're right, the stain on your species may well be indelible. He paused, his big tired eyes studying me. But maybe there's also still some hope left. For after all, it was his own courage and homicidal ingenuity that saved us from total extermination. Perhaps one day that same fire can be tamed and directed for the good of our wounded galaxy. A tense murmur ran through the chamber as other species considered his words. I just nodded in grim acknowledgement. It was the most he could hope for now. So be it. We will rebuild from scratch if necessary, and whatever indirect judgments await us, humans will accept them head on. For despite the depths of darkness we had climbed during the war, I still believed that one day we could redeem ourselves. Not just in front of the aliens, but in front of ourselves. Years have passed since the end of the Grox War. The collective wounds were beginning to heal at last, even if the physical and psychological scars remained vivid. The galaxy was slowly rebuilding, reforming a certain semblance of order and progress. 
but for me the internal turmoil had not subsided. I still felt the weight of those dark days hanging over me like a toxic cloud, never really letting me appreciate the hard-won peace. That's why I accepted when the young diplomat Zyrilli asked me to meet in one of Sentax's memorial gardens. She had been one of the few civilian survivors I had found in the rubble in the early days of the war. Now, years later, she was working for a galactic reconstruction organization, promoting healing and reconciliation. I found her in an open clearing, admiring a monument to the fallen. Her slender alien body was wrapped in a multicolored ceremonial robe, enhancing her large contemplative eyes. As I approached, she turned and smiled warmly. Ah, Commander Alexander, we finally met again. It's good to see him again. Please just call me Alex, I replied with a forced smile. That military title was obsolete a long time ago. She nodded, her face taking on a more solemn expression. As you prefer. I'm grateful I came. I feel like we need to talk in particular. I followed her to a stone bench at the far end of the clearing. For a few moments we just sat in contemplative silence, watching the statues and monuments erected to the countless dead. I remember you know, Zyrilli said finally in a low tone. When we were just a scared child and you the warrior commander who needed to comfort me among the ruins of my world. I stared at the features of the nearest monument, a sculptural colloid projected in constant change. As appealing as the alien art was, it couldn't hide the reminder of all the death and suffering. You must not remember, I replied heavily. For at that time, I myself was far from being a warrior, just a lost human trying to control a force he couldn't comprehend. Zyrilli didn't say anything, just waited patiently as I gathered my troubled thoughts. You've seen the best and the worst of me, and of humanity as a whole. Both the determination to make any sacrifice for the sake of survival. As for the dark cruelty we were capable of when our backs were against the wall. I took a deep breath, suppressing old emotions that threatened to rise. I know it must be hard for you or anyone else to look into my eyes and see anything but the old war monster from the Grox campaign one who was willing to destroy entire worlds if necessary. To my surprise, Zyrilli shook his head with a placid expression. No, Alex. All I see are the eyes of a survivor, one who carries the weight of the universe on his shoulders and yet continues to search for some redemption. She indicated the memorials around us with a delicate wave. All these monuments are dedicated to the pain and sacrifice that the war has imposed on us. But if you look closely, they also represent a desire to move forward and overcome that darkness. Her eyes met mine in a direct, sympathetic gaze. You can feel that your hands are stained with blood, Alex. But I see in them the potential to rebuild and heal our wounded galaxy. After all, it was those same hands that rescued me from the ruins and gave me hope in the midst of despair. I was silent, considering his words with a mixture of shock and sudden relief. Perhaps Zyrilli was right. Perhaps, after all, there was still a spark of my humanity intact a spark of recalcitrant hope that refused to be extinguished, no matter how deep I sank into darkness. Yes, the ghosts of war would still haunt me for the rest of my life. But perhaps it was precisely because of the depths I had witnessed that I could work with even more determination to build a better future. One where peace and reconciliation reigned supreme over hatred and destruction. I reached out and lightly touched Zyrilli's arm, feeling a new sense of purpose and responsibility. Thank you, my old friend. Your words give me a new perspective, and hope that perhaps it is not too late to redeem some of the humanity that remains in me. She smiled warmly and placed her hand over mine in a gesture of connection between two survivors of a nightmare that no one else would wish to relive. And in that moment of mutual understanding, I knew that this would only be the first step of a much larger journey. To heal the scars of war, rebuild what was lost, and perhaps one day rekindle the spark of hope across the wounded galaxy.